Okay, amazing AP Bio 2 kiddos. We're going to do a lesson um, really quickly. Hopefully it's quickly. I'm going to do the best I can. Um, on the chromosomal basis of inheritance, which the topic really is, I'm going to talk about these things called linked genes. So before I start into the, the bottom part of the, the PowerPoint, I'm going to kind of get you into the zone with where we've been. So far up to this point, we've really been focusing on Mendel, okay? And Mendel, when Mendel was using his pea plants, he introduced this idea of the laws of segregation and the laws of independent assortment. So when Thomas Hunt Morgan, down here, Thomas Hunt Morgan was working with his fruit flies, Drosophila, um, he was applying Mendel's laws of segregation and independent assortment and kind of stumbled upon something that didn't really work and didn't fall into this Mendelian independent assortment. So to get you to understand this, I'm going to go back to what should be if it falls underneath independent assortment and laws of segregation. Okay, so to illustrate this, I'm going to um, start off with a purebred generation. Okay, so let's review a couple concepts. If I take a P generation times a P generation, so I'm talking about a purebred times a purebred, this is the parental generation, I should get my F1 offspring. Okay, so when Mendel crossed, let's say, homozygous dominant tall plants that have uh, round seeds, big T, big T, times, or big, big T, big T, big R, big R, and he crossed them with purebred recessive, little t, little t, little r, little r. All of the F1 offspring are hybrids, okay, but I'm using two traits, so it's hybrid for both, so we would get F1 offspring that are big T, little t, big R, little r, okay, and hopefully y'all can see that by now because that's nothing more than using definition, but this happened every single time. So a purebred parent for two traits times a purebred parent that's recessive for the same two traits is always going to lead to these hybrids that are heterozygous for those two traits. So to get you to understand this, I'm going to give this F1 offspring a name. Okay, we're talking about Bob the pea plant right now. So Bob the pea plant is big T, little t, big R, little r. And Bob falls in love with a female pea plant. Okay, her name is Sue. And she happens to be completely homozygous recessive, little t, little t, little r, little r. Well, this is a vocabulary term as well for you guys. Basically, this is a test cross. Okay, a test cross is when you cross one of your plants times one that is completely homozygous recessive, okay, at what, all positions. Okay, so Bob and Sue are going to get together and they're going to have little baby pea plants. Well, what you have to look at is, remember, Bob got like half of his alleles from his mom and half of his alleles from his dad. So let's just pretend like that, I'm going to use a color right here, let's just pretend like Bob got this big T from his mom and he got this big, T, big R from his mom. So those are his maternal alleles and let's just say I'm going to use red here, that he got this one from his dad, the little T, and the little R from his dad. And the same thing applies to Sue, but I'm really just going to use Bob to illustrate this for you guys. Well, according to Mendel's laws of independent assortment that we went over last week in class, Bob could pass on, when Bob makes a sperm, remember he's going to make four possibilities, he could pass on this big T with this big R, in other words, the one he got from his mom and the one he got from his mom, could pass that on, big T, big R, and that could be a sperm, okay, or he could pass on the big T with the little R, big T with the little R, or he could pass on the little t with the big R or the little t with the little r. Okay, so these are his four possibilities according to Mendel and what we did last week. Well, Sue, hers is pretty easy. When she makes an egg, she only has one choice for what, what combination she can get. She can only give a little t and a little r. So all of her eggs are going to have the same letter combination. Okay, well, what Mendel said is that if this is true, okay, and you put these together through fertilization, and if you need to draw a Punnett square, draw it, but I'm just going to kind of show you like this. If that comes together with this, this first offspring is going to get big T, little t, big R, little r. Well, look at what that baby is. That baby's tall and round. That baby looks like Bob. Looks like, that baby looks like his dad. Okay, this baby is going to be big T, little t, little r, little r. Well, that baby doesn't look like either parent because Bob, and I'm going to actually change color so that you can see this. i use a green. Okay, Bob is tall, comma, round. Bob marries Sue, a complete recessive. She is short, comma, wrinkled. Okay, so this offspring doesn't look like Bob and doesn't look like Sue. All right, well, look at this one. If we switch back to pink. 
Okay, if this one comes, this is going to be a little t, little t, little t, little t, big R, little r, which doesn't look like Bob or Sue either. Okay, the last combination, little t here, if we bring this one, I'm going to bring it kind of over here, little t from Bob, little t from Sue, little r from Bob, little r from Sue. Okay, so look at the possible choices here. Okay, and if we look at what they look like, this one is tall, comma, round. This one is tall, comma, wrinkled. This one is short, comma, round. And this one is short, comma, wrinkled. Okay, well, according to Mendel, if you were to figure out what is the probability, okay, it's a one-fourth chance for each of these four offspring types. It's one-fourth to one-fourth to one-fourth to one-fourth. And if you can't see that without actually doing the Punnett square boxes and using the multiplication rule, please feel free to, to do that. But you can take my word for it. If you use the multiplication rule, it's one-fourth to one-fourth to one-fourth to one-fourth. So basically, it's a 25% chance that this group of offspring right here will look like Bob. So I'm going to highlight that. These kids look like Bob. Bob's tall round. These kids are tall round. Okay, look at these kids down here. Short wrinkled. That's these guys. Those kids look like Sue. Well, what that means is that 25% and 25%, if I add those together, 50% of the offspring, 50% of the offspring look like the parents. Those are known as the parentals. Okay, those are the parental variety. Well, the other variety, and I'm going to change colors here, that's these two that are in the middle. These don't look like the parents because this one's tall, wrinkled, and this one's short, round, okay, and none of the parents fit into that. That's known as your recombinants. That's a vocabulary term. So 50% look like the parentals, and 50% we call our recombinants. That means it's recombinations that don't look like the parentals. Well, according to Mendel's law of independent assortment, this is what would happen if the genes are located far apart or they're located on two different chromosomes, you would have pretty much about 50% of the offspring that would resemble the parents and about 50% would re resemble recombinants. And out of the parents, if you were to split that up, 25% look like one parent, 25% look like the other parent. Okay, so that's, that's kind of what you would see. Well, Thomas Hunt Morgan, He's using his fruit flies over here, and he knows these laws of, of Mendel's independent assortment and laws of segregation. So he uses these fruit flies, and he does the same experiment, and something happens bizarre. He ends up getting numbers that do not look anything like this 50%, 50%, 50% parentals, 50% recombinants. He ends up getting way greater than 50% of his offspring that look like the parentals. And he's like, what? How is that happening? That's crazy. So he then determined, that I'm going to show you on the next page, that it has to be something like the two genes that are in question must be located on the same chromosome, and they're really close together, and therefore we're going to use the term these genes, these two genes are linked together. And so if they're linked, they're going to be inherited together. So therefore, what you have from your mom, like up here in the case of Bob, his big T he got from his mom, there's a higher likelihood that he's also going to pass that big R from his mom, and therefore more of his children will look like him with that dominant phenotype. Okay, he didn't get 100% looking like the parentals. So this says right here, this wasn't always true that the, all the offspring look like the parents. He had some that were recombinants, but it was overwhelmingly way greater than 50% of the offspring looking like the parentals, which, which led to this idea of linked genes. Okay, so we're going to apply that on the next page. Okay, so I'm going to use this as a, as a practice problem. Okay, so in fruit flies, normal wild type, and by the way, wild type in, in Morgan's experiments, wild type, type always represented the dominant trait. And it was really what he saw most often. That's not always true today. Just because a trait has a dominant allele doesn't mean that it's the most commonly found in the population, because I've mentioned this to you guys before. But polydactyly, which is six fingers and six toes or extra digits, is a dominant allele that causes that. But it's definitely not more frequent in the human population to have six fingers or six toes. But it just so happened in his fruit fly experiment. Um, and the reason he said that was because whatever the um, mutant phenotype was had to be because of some sort of mutation. 
Okay, so that's why he called it wild type was dominant, found most often, and then the other form, which is the mutant type, was going to be the recessive allele. So I'm giving you a key. Okay, here's your key. Capital G is wild type or gray body, little g is black body, big W is wild type or normal wings, little w is mutant wings. Okay, so he took his true breeding, he took his parental uh, generation, which was big G, big G, big W, big W, and crossed them with, with his true breeding, little g, little g, little w, little w. Okay, so that's his parental cross. He created his F1 offspring. So right here, you should know this by now. All of his F1 were big G, little g, big W, little w, which meant they all showed, let's see, you know, typically, gray body and normal wings. Okay, that's his first parent. Well, what he did with that is he decided to do his F1 test cross. So he took that parent, crossed it with a test cross, which is little g, little g, little w, little w, which that parent, in parentheses, I'm going to put what it looks like. Go back up here and look. Black body, black body, comma, little w's are mutant wings. So these are the two parents, okay? This one right here times the, the test cross. Well, if Mendelian laws of independent assortment were to occur, okay, let, let's show you again what should happen, then over here it should be some get big G, big W of this one. We're going to call this one Bob again and Sue again. It's easier to think of them as, like, names when you see it so I can refer to it. So what Bob would form as far as, for, far as his sperm would go, he could have one that has big G, big W, okay? He could have one that gets big G, little W, big G, little W, one that gets the two in the middle, little G, big W, and one that gets the last two, which is little G, little W. So these are all four possibility for a sperm. I probably need to redraw that one because that looks really bad. Sorry. It's not perfect. Okay, anyway, big G, big W, big G, little W, like that. Okay, so then the Sue test cross is only going to be an egg that has little g, little w. All right, same thing that we did on the last problem before. If we bring these together, this one and this one, what we're going to get for that choice is big g, little g, big w, little w. If these two come together, look what I'm going to show you. Big g, little w, little g, little w, little w. Boom, boom. Okay, these two come together. Little g, little g, big w, little w. Last ones little g, little g, little w, little w. Okay, well, let's write out to the side phenotypically what they look like. This first one would be capital G, which is gray body, capital W, which is normal. Okay, this one right here is gray, comma, little is mutant wings. Okay, this one is little g's, which is black, capital W, normal, this one is complete recessive, which is black, comma, mutant. All right. So according to, remember, Mendelian laws of independent assortment, this should be a fourth of the offspring or this, a fourth of the offspring this, a fourth of the offspring this, and a fourth fall into that category. Okay, so then as far as, like, who looks like the parent? Okay, look back over here at Bob. Bob is gray, normal. Look over here, gray normal right here. So we would expect these guys to look like Bob. Okay, look at Sue, black mutant. These are black mutant right here. So according to Mendel, a fourth and a fourth, I should expect one-fourth plus one-fourth, which is two-fourths reduced to one-half. I should expect half that look like the parentals. And these two right here that are in the middle, if I circle them in green, these are my recombinants right here, okay, the greens, and it would be the same thing. A fourth plus a fourth equals two-fourths, which is one-half that should be recombinants, okay? So apply some numbers to that. Let's say you had 2,300 flies. How many should he have observed, should he have counted for each of those different types? Well, all you would do is take your 2,300, divided by 4, Okay, right? 4 times 5 is 20. 3, 0, carry that. What goes into 30? 7. Just had to think for a minute. 
<laughs> carry the two and zero. Five. So 575. Sorry, it's like late and I'm doing this. So the expectation is 575 should be that genotype, okay, and be gray normal. 575 should be that genotype and be gray mutant. 575 should fall into that, and 575 should fall into that. Here's the dealio, squealio. Look at his results. These were Mendel's, uh, Mendel, these were Thomas Hunt Morgan's results. 965, look at this, gray with normal wings. That's like Bob, right? Look down right here. 944 that were black with mutant wings. That's like Sue. So here's Bob, he's a parent. Here's Sue, she's a parent. If I add up 965 plus 944, that's 9, okay, 6 and 4 is 10, carry the 1, 18, 19. 900, 1,909 offspring look like the parentals. Okay, that means that is way greater than 50%. That told Thomas Hunt Morgan that he had to have had these genes located close together. So like the G, the big G, was really close to the big W, and so there was a higher chance that he passed on that big G and that big W in his sperm, and then the one that he had where he had the little G and the little W, because remember, he got one G from mom and one G from dad, one W from mom, one, one W from dad, there was a higher chance that these were passed on together. So he had a higher proportion of sperm that ended up getting the big G and big W and a higher pro proportion that got the little G and little W, which is why so many look like the parents. See, it didn't matter with Sue. Sue could only give a little G and a little W. What mattered was what was Bob forming whenever he, he went through meiosis and did this. Okay, well, then the question, though, that Morgan said is, well, how come they aren't all like the parents? How come it wasn't 100% like the parentals? And the answer that we soon realized was, you're going to have crossover events. Crossing over is still going to occur, so if I were to put, okay, the letters that he used, okay, this would be, let's say, big G, right here, I'll show you what he used, big G, little g, big W, right here, little w, okay, and he had these chromosomes, because remember, they, they doubled, big G, oops, I forgot this, little g, right there. Big G, little g, oh, that's a W, silly goose. That's a big W, that's a big W. That's a little W, that's a little W. Okay, that's big, big, little, little. Okay, so what he, they realized, Morgan realized that there has to be some breaking right here, and this one switches with that other one, and of course we know this happens in prophase one of meiosis, which this leads to the recombinants that are formed. So even though we had 2,300 offspring, 1909 ended up looking like the parentals, but we had this 206 here and the 185 over here that these were the recombinants. So recombinants, according to Morgan, which we now know this is true, these were formed, even though these genes were linked, the recombinants were due to crossover events that happened during prophase one of meiosis when those tetrads come together. So in this case, there's 206 plus 185 recombinants. If you add those together, 391 are recombinants. Okay, well, something cool is Morgan had students that worked for him, and I think one of the guy's names was like Sturdivant. So they worked together, and they determined that however many recombinants you have, you can then determine what the recombination frequency is. So you just take your number of recombinants, 391, divide it by your total number. So if I take the 1909 plus the 391, that should come out to my 2300 flies. So if you divide that by 2300, multiply times 100, you get a recombination frequency. It's a percent. So what that tells you is that's the percent of time that crossover, crossover events are occurring. It also gives you an idea of how far apart these two uh, genes are from each other on the chromosomes. Okay? So it's a cool little thing. So let me show you on the next slide.
So according to this probability, okay, before I switch slides, I want to show you this. This should be a 17% recombination frequency. Okay, well, that's going to help us look at some other things. Okay, let me switch slides and I'll show you. So that led um, Thomas Hunt Morgan and some of his students to create what we use today, which are called linkage maps. Okay, you can actually look at a linkage map and see how far apart genes are based on the recombination frequency. So the further apart two genes are, the higher probability that a crossover event will occur. And therefore, you're going to have a higher percent of recombination frequency. Okay, so like right here in this last scenario, you can see this black gene and this green gene, the fact that they're far apart means that you could have a break when they cross over, which means you're going to get a higher percent of recombinants from that because those crossover events are highly likely. Whereas if it did break right here, look what's happening in the second picture. The black gene and the white gene are so close together that even if this broke and switched, they're going to go together. Okay, so the further apart, the higher the probability, which means the higher the recombination frequency. All right, so let's do a little problem. Let's practice with some of the math on this. Okay, I gave you the formula a minute ago, but here it is for you so that you can use um, for your Drosophila problems, the, the lab that you're going to be completing for homework. So whatever the number of recombinants that you have, you divide that by the total number of offspring, divide, or times it by 100, and you're going to get your percent frequency of recombination. Well, the cool thing is, whatever that is, is going to also equal the map units because they determined that one map unit on a chromosome is equal to 1% recombination frequency. So it's kind of cool because if you know, for instance, that let's say this gene right here is an A gene, and you know the distance between the A gene and the B gene is a certain number of map units, let's say it's eight map units apart, and then you discover or you find another gene, and let's say there's a C gene, and you go, well, guess what? The distance between the C gene and the B gene is four, and the distance between the A gene and the C gene is four, then you can place that C gene in between the two by knowing how many map units apart each gene is from each other. And like I said, that map unit is also equal to the percent recombination frequency between them. So there would be a 4% recombination frequency between A and C, 4% between C and B, but an 8% recombination frequency between A and B. So it allows us to build a map and know where human genes fall on a chromosome. So all this came about by using fruit flies and Thomas Hunt Morgan's research, so it's amazing. Okay, so let's do a little practice problem down here. So we did an F1 cross times a test cross, same thing. Okay, we've got these 2,300 offspring. Okay, here's your math should have counted, this is what, uh, should have counted, remember, 575 of each, okay, should have counted that, actually counted this, okay, we actually already did this problem together, okay, therefore, these two recombinants, we did this already, 206 plus 185, that gives you your 11, 9, 391, did I add that right, 11, yeah, okay, that gives you your 391, so once again, my 391 divided by my total 2,300 flies multiplied by my 100 gives me that 17% recombination frequency. So this is the same problem we did. We'll practice with another one in a minute. Okay, so here's one. Let's try, let's try this one. Okay, sorry, I thought that was this one, but I got all thrown off. All right, in a genetics experiment with fruit flies, P generation true breeding flies are crossed. The female parent is brown with normal wings while the male parent is black and wingless. Here's your figuring out like what's what. All the F1 flies are brown with normal wings. Remember, F1 are hybrids, y'all, and all the F1s are always looking like whatever the dominant allele is. So brown is dominant and normal wing is dominant. We can tell just by looking at the F1 flies. So for my key, I'm just going to go capital B is brown. Okay, little b, I can look down here, is actually black. Okay, I'm going to do uh, capital N is normal. That's my wild type, big N I mean, and then little n is wingless. Okay, big N normal, little n wingless, big B brown, little b black. So F1 would look like this, big B, little b, big N, little n. All right, look what it says they're going to do. In the next cross, these F1 females are going to be test crossed. So we're going to cross that with a little b, little b, little n, little n. Okay, let's go ahead and write underneath this. These are what the parentals look like. Okay, this parent is brown, comma, normal. The test cross parent is black, comma, wingless. 
because remember, you're looking at what they look like as far as recombinants versus the parentals. All right, I'm going to change my color to, like, use a blue here. All right, so if we use Mendel's Law of Independent Assortment, okay, let's do what we, we normally do. What we would expect is, this is going to be Bob again and Sue. Yes, I named them all Bob and Sue. Okay, so Bob could form these four sperm, ready? Big B, big N, D, big B, little N, little B, big N, little B, little N. Okay, here's Sue, here's her egg, little B, little N. Okay, let's look at our four combinations. Okay, this sperm right here goes with this one, so we're going to have big B, little B, big N, little N. This one, big B, little B, little N, little N. All I'm doing is adding this with that. Okay, this sperm with that egg up there. Now we're going to go here. This sperm with that egg. We're going to go little B, little B, big N, little N. Down here, little B, little B, little N, little N. Okay, let's compare them now to the parentals, right? I'm going to use my little highlighter. Okay, Bob was brown normal. Okay, this is brown normal right here, brown normal. Okay, Sue was black and wingless. This is black and wingless right here. So I'm going to write that out to the side just so that you can see this. This is black, comma, wingless. This is brown, comma, normal. All right, let's look at what we have over here. Brown normal, we need brown normal. That's this right here. This is brown normal. That looks like Bob. Okay, that's a parental. We need black and wingless. Black and wingless is right here. That's a parental. Okay, that means these two, I'm going to use my different color pen. These are our recombinants. Okay, so that's a lot of recombinants, right? So we're going to add those together. We want to kind of see what that frequency is. Remember, we want the recombinants. 728 plus 712 recombinants. We add those together. 2, 3, 4. 1,440 recombinants. Okay, how many total flies were produced? Okay, we're going to add this. I'm going to use my calculadora. 1440 plus, you probably already did this in your head, 85 plus 75. Total number of flies, 1600. So I'm going to take my 1440 recombinants divided by 1600 total flies, multiply my answer by 100. Okay, 1440 divided by 1600 equals 0.9 times 100 is 90%. So I literally have a 90% recombination frequency. Therefore, these two genes are located 90 MAP units apart. MAP units apart. Y'all, because of that, there is most likely, like these genes most likely are not linked because they are really far apart on the same chromosome. Remember, in order for it to be linked, okay, you may want to put a dot here, to be linked, the, cat, the criteria is you must have greater than 50% of the offspring that look like the parentals. Well, this isn't the case here. In fact, we have 90% of the offspring that are all recombinants. Therefore, these are most likely not linked and are really, really far apart on the same chromosome. And we figured out that they're 90 MAP units apart. Okay, got it? All right, let's see. Here's another one. We're going to draw a chromosome on this one. The genes for vestigial wings, black body, and cinnabar eyes are linked genes. Okay, we've got three traits here. Vestigial wings, black body, cinnabar eyes. Okay, in controlled crosses, Vestigial wings and body color have a 17% crossover rate. Okay, so what you're looking at, hang on, we're being rudely interrupted. Okay, here we go. Let's finish this up. So if you wanted to take um, the crossover percent rates and you wanted to draw a chromosome and where these genes fell, here's a typical example. If we know that the gene for vestigial wings, VG, and body color have a 17% crossover rate, then you could draw where these fall, like VG could be here, and, 17, uh, and uh, excuse me, B would be over here, and there would be 17% or 17 MAP units between those two. 
Okay, then if we know that CN and body color, okay, so body color is B, and then CN have a 9% crossover rate. So your question is, is it going to go over here or is it going to go over here? Okay, are we going to put CN on this side or are we going to put CN on this side? We'll read what it says now about eye color, CN, and vestigial wings. That's a 9.5. Well, that means if this is going to be 9.5 away from there and it needs to be uh, 9 away from B, I have to place it in the middle. So here's what the chromosome would look like. Let me reveal this to you. Here we go. If I could get rid of this little screen. Okay, here we go. That's what the chromosome would look like. So you can see CN is in the middle between B and VG. So my 17% recombination frequency or crossover rate is between the B and the VG. Okay, but I have 9.5 between these two and 9 between those. Now some of you are adding up the numbers and you're like, well, wait a second. 9 plus 9.5 is not 17. Okay, 9 plus 9.5 is 18.5% or 18.5 MAP units. How come this only says 17? So the answer to that, if you're wondering, um, it's because of the few times that one crossover could occur between B and CN, and another crossover could occur between CN and VG. And so what happens is the second crossover would cancel out the first, which reduces the observed B-VG combination frequency while contributing to the frequency between um, the closer pairs of genes. So that's kind of where those numbers come from. Okay, so what the geneticists said is that they would um, put those smaller distances between them. All right, so last problem. Here we go. We're going to finish up this lecture, see if you guys can do this. Um, if FFHH is crossed with little f, little f, little h, little h, okay, and then we're going to test cross. So in other words, this is the parental P, parental purebred times purebred. We get F1. Big F, little f, big H, little h. So now what we're going to do with that is take, that's the F1, we're going to test cross it. Okay, what percentage of the test cross progeny will be, okay, little, 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 little. So you just keep doing the same thing we, we did. Okay, you're always taking the same combination. Do you notice that? So if I have big F, little f, big H, little h, I could go big F, big H to a sperm. Okay, big F, little h, little f, big h, little f, little h, just like we did on all the other problems. But if I cross that with my test cross, little, 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 that's going to give me big F, little h are the only things that can go. Okay, so add those together, just like we did before, big F, little f, big h, little h. This one gives you big F, little f, little h, little h little f, little f, big h, little h. And if you're wondering what I'm doing, I'm adding this one with this one, this one with that one, this one with that one, and this one with that one to give me my four choices for offspring. Okay, so little, 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 little. All right, once again, which looks like the parent, this one right here, if I could get my little highlighter, there we go. This one looks like that parent. This one looks like that parent. What do I expect? Remember, I expect 25%. 25%, 25%, percent, 25%, if they are not linked. That's what I expect. Well, look what the question's asking you. We want to know what percentage of the progeny will be, look at the choice, completely recessive, little, 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 little. Well, look down here. Little, 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 little. We would expect 25% if these genes were not linked. Okay? If they are completely linked with no crossover events, okay, completely linked, then we would expect no crossover means we don't get any recombinants, none of these. That's no crossover. So then we would expect 50% of this parent and 50% to look like that parent, which means our answer is 50% because that's going to be 50% that look like one parent, 50% that look like the other. That's if there's no crossing over, okay? Now, how, what percent is this if there's 16 map units apart? Okay, watch how I'm going to do this. If there's 16 map units apart, that's 16% recombinants. Okay, watch what that means. Go back over here. 16% recombinants are these ones I crossed out. Well, if 16% are these, 
then I have to figure out what percent are these other ones out of 100. So what I'm going to do is go 100% minus 16% recombinance gives me 84% that would look like the big F, little f, big H, little h, and 50% of half of that that would look like little f, little f, little h, little h. So what I have to do is take this 84% would look like the parentals and divide that by 2. So what I would expect is 42% of the offspring to be completely little, 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 little. Because the other 42% that makes up the 84 would look like this parent up here. Okay, so my answer on that one, if it's 16 map units apart, I would expect 42%. All right, let's try another one. What if they're 38 map units apart? Okay, well, 38 map units is equal to 38% recombination frequency, y'all. That means my other percentage, that equals to 100. I take 100% minus 38. Okay, what's my answer to this? 62, right? 70, 80, 92, yep. So I have a 62% of my offspring that look like the parentals. Well, if 62% look like the parentals, half of that are going to look like the dominant one, big F, little f, big H, little h, and half of that are going to look like little f, little h, f, little, little h, little h. Well, I'm asking up here on the question about this one. That's what I want to know. So I have to now take my 62%, divide by 2, that's going to give me 31% for my answer. Okay, 31% of the offspring are going to look like that one. All right, now you try, you practice with the sheet that I gave you to do for homework. All right, that concludes this lecture.